Four. Greetings, everyone from Nicaragua. We have our community in quarantine, our artist residency, the final week here in Nicaragua, and very fortunate to be joined by neuroscientists and alternative health medicine specialists, alongside a, a whole plethora of other uh, really cool titles and experience working in the medicine field and wellness. Um, so, Corey, thank you so much for dropping in with us on the call. Yeah, ha happy to be here. I I was I was hoping I'd be able to go shirtless like you too, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm in Calgary and it, it's minus five. So. <laughs> yeah, we're in peak heat of the day. It is not it is not cold here. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Great. Well, I'm sure you've had a lot of people approach you asking some of your opinions on what's happening with COVID-19. And I know you work a lot with uh, the different like lymphatic systems in the body and um, where illness comes from, how much of it is affected by both the mind and circadian rhythm. So you've got a whole bunch of experience uh, working with some very new and cutting edge technology um, things here. So yeah, I guess passing things over to you, I guess, well, first of all, a, a bit on, on your background, if you want to give us a little bit of a history of um, some of the projects you've been involved with, and then we'll get into some of the current situation of where we're at right now. Yeah, sure. So one one specialty that of mine uh, that, that I kind of bring to the table is something called psychoneuroimmunology, um, which is basically how do you, how does the behavior, how do, how do our behaviors, our mind uh, our, our neurological systems, our nervous system, and the immune system all interconnect, um, you know, and, and how, and, and the interesting thing is how they all influence each other. Um, it's not a one-way street when it comes to, uh, to these three different systems, but I got into this field of study back, I guess, you know, third, third, fourth year university. I actually started getting a lot of problems from concussion. And uh, previous concussions I'd had in my life all of a sudden started catching up to me. And my brain just was not working well. I could tell it wasn't working well. Uh, I finished up my master's. I, you know, barely got through it, which was kind of a, a shock to me because I always, I always found school came really easy to me. And I was, I was constantly a asking doctors and trying to seek out advice on, you know, what can I do and, and how can I help my brain? Um, you know, one, one thing that was big for me was uh, anxiety kind of coming out of the blue. Nobody could tell me where it was coming from. Um, no, no solution other than drugs, really. And so I, I really wanted to seek out, okay, you know, what, what, what's my brain doing? You know, I was in neuroscience. I had access to an MRI lab. That was really cool, you know, looking, looking at functional MRIs. It still didn't really tell me much. Um, I went into the, the natural medicine side and started investigating that a little bit. And, there, you know, there's a lot of good things on that end, too. Um, but still, you know, I didn't really find the, the meat and potatoes of why I was, I was having these problems. And so I stumbled across a piece of technology shortly after that called quantitative EEG. And what quantitative EEG does... It's kind of like an MRI where when we get an MRI of the brain, we can see the structure of it. Right? So uh, we'll MRI if we suspect there might be a, a brain bleed or a tumor or, or other uh, abnormality. And with quantitative EEG, it, it's similar to that. If you can look at the function of the brain. So immediately you can see if and why somebody might be having anxiety. Uh, if and why they might be having depression, memory problems, uh, brain fog, other cognitive issues, sleep issues, pain, uh, chronic pain becomes actually manifested in the brain after we get through a process called allodynia. Uh, there's a, a, one of my mentors, Laura Mermosley, uh, helps, helps you understand allodynia. Allodynia is the you know, if you hit something really hard, like you, you know, say you hit your, your shin really hard on the, the hitch of a truck walking behind it, right? It's, it's like, hello, Dinia, here I am. And that, that's how you kind of remember the acute pain of like, ow, shit, that really hurt. Um, and then there's this process where we move from that into the chronic pain and, and our brain adapts and it starts integrating it in the brain. And so you can actually see that. Um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, really quite quite interesting so this technology is allowing us to actually see okay um, what how is the brain functioning are we having trauma in the brain for instance now what we found is there's about eight main causes of disease and disorders 
this includes even chronic illnesses that you might not see in the brain like cancer um, where there's an immune inflammatory problem there's either a, or a metabolic problem a trauma response um, a network dysfunction going on in the brain which can lead to a network dysfunction in the gut um, that's more of the kind of the neurological manifestations there's endocrine or hormone related problems um, there's cerebellar or thalamic related problems and these are just basically like the microprocessors of the brain not working properly and then there's higher level disorder cultural trauma spiritual trauma this is pretty much what causing all these in our world right now what we need to do and what and what we do at nirvana health is we pick apart uh, for every person what it is that's affecting them the most because even if you have similar symptoms or similar diagnoses there can be a lot different issues causing that same problem so you know you could be having an immune related infection uh, it's driving an issue in the brain whereas somebody else with the exact same problem might be having a metabolic problem or a hormone related problem um, sometimes people have multiple subtypes and that that makes it a little more complex so uh, we have a database now of about 5,000 brain scans with biomedical data uh, to show like you know what is actually causing this brain dysfunction and then we can go in set up pr programs for people to be able to resolve that issue so it's uh, it's been yeah that I mean that's been my main project probably for the past yeah, close to 10 years I guess, uh, you know, starting with initial research and now that's been, uh, we're going on seven years now where we've been able to actually start building these databases together, taking these brain scans. The other cool thing is we can do, we get people onto programs, you know, utilizing alternative medicine. Some people have certain things they want to be doing and they want to see, okay, is it changing my brain? Like, you know what, like I think it should be. Uh, Cause of course we have this fun effect called the placebo effect. So uh, we want to make sure that we're actually getting getting measurable change. Uh, so yeah, it's it's been really really cool to see all these different techniques, and it's really led me down an integrative medical path because you you see all sorts of things, uh, you know, whether it be natural, alternative, um, psychological, spiritual, all these things actually having a measurable effect. Um, and so you know, it's just about trying to kind of find what's going to work best for each person. So it's, uh, you know, now we bring ourselves into what's going on in the world right now. Um, and, you know, they're, everybody's kind of looking for this, you know, what is the one thing I can do? Uh, and it's not quite that simple because we, we are all really snowflakes. Um, you know, even if you, if you dig into our minds and the way our nervous system is, is organized, we are all organized a little bit different. So it's, it's really helping people be able to kind of figure out, okay, what, what's, what, where are you going to get the best bang for your buck? Where should you, you focus your time and energy? So yeah, it's been, uh, been just a, an amazing project. Yeah. So very cool. Well, that gives a good, good background on some of the, the questions to come and some of the um, ways we can steer this conversation. Um, coming back to where we're at right now, I mean, you're in quarantine in your, in your place in Calgary there and, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that people are trying to make connect the dots with, whether it is, um, you know, this happening because of just it being a perfect storm of a virus or of it being from 5G or if it being more of a concept of our minds. And then, you know, whatever you want to call it, do you have any interpretation that you would say as to what what's caused this to be such a big outbreak and such a big thing? Yeah, well, I mean, mother mother nature is brilliant, first of all. So there, I mean, there's some speculation that this thing's been made in a lab. Uh, you know, that that's not really the case from what we've found um, with the type of genome research we have. It's really hard for anybody to design anything or even manipulate anything uh, on the genetic level to and not be able to have leave a tag of some sort um it, it was just a, it was a circumstance that that had just happened i mean there, there's probably some higher level uh you know intention going on i don't i don't know it depends on your belief system but um it i think it's more of a reflection what what is happening right now of just our our fear and, and the fear of change and the fear of unknown and, and we're all going through a collective trauma. 
which is really unique because the world has never been has never had a trauma like this and been so connected at the same time so you're you're seeing it's kind of like when you're in a relationship with somebody for long enough um you know there's something called the shadow self um that we that we project outward all the time it's the the piece of ourselves we don't want to we don't want to turn towards and a lot of really good union psychology principles talk about this and so i think it's we're going through a drama and so people want to point their finger at something um they want to they want to say you know this this person's to blame or this is to blame and they react and they lash out and that's exactly what the limbic system in the brain is designed to do um, and this is the this is the child brain. It's it's our emotional survival system. Really, really, really interesting system. Um, I'm actually if if you if you don't mind, do, do you mind if I just share a little image uh, of of a brain? I can kind of point out what I'm talking about. Like that, that for people yeah, it's, that it's uh, are, are visual Perfect. learners, I think that might help. Perfect. So this is a this is a an example of a of a brain map here, and we these area if you see these area this area down here where this kind of white spot is where my cursor is this is the corpus callosum and right above it is an area called the cingulate um, and then off to just to the left and to the right are some areas called the amygdala and the hippocampus uh, these these are this area all deep down in the brain this is all called the limbic system and its whole role is to detect threats in the environment so Anything that I'm seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or, or feeling in my body is being relayed through an area called the thalamus, which is this blue area here. Um, now, blue for this person, uh, blue means under-functioning, not functioning well. Um, but that, that area relays it off to this limbic system. And it's kind of like a baton pass where the thalamus goes, okay, limbic system, is this dangerous? The limbic system taps into old memories. It's always an old memory. It's never, it's never a future projection. It's always something old. Um, it taps into old memories and it goes, it either goes, no, I don't see any relation here to anything dangerous. We can, we can go ahead and approach this situation or the stimulus, uh, or it goes, no, this is, this is bad. This is scary. We either have to fight this or we have to run from it. And we make, we make one of two decisions. Um, we've actually found a third reaction now in mammalian brain, which is uh, called, it's called polyvagal. This is a neurological response uh, that actually causes us to freeze or, or we, we paralyze. And so then we don't do anything. We don't fight and we don't run away. And so a lot of people have heard of the fight or flight system. This is how it's engaged on the emotional level. So if I see something on Facebook, for instance, right? Um, or all of a sudden I see the life around me is kind of uh, falling apart, so to speak. I, I get different types of reactions and it depends on my old memories. I, I had a talk with a, a lady the other day and she said she's having a really hard time right now because when she was seven years old, she was homeless with her mother. And now that all this is going down and there's this financial devastation, all of those memories are starting to come back. Um, she's in tune with it, so she understands where it comes from. So she's doing a good job not projecting it outward. Um, but a lot of people don't understand their old traumas. And so now that this is happening, they're projecting, they're lashing out. Um, we're, we, don't, we don't collectively, we don't know how to regulate well, right? Not a lot of people have, are, are really involved in the practice of meditation and yoga, I know you, you as a group are, you guys are amazing for, for integrating that into your lives, but we just, we, we don't know a lot about our brain. So we did, we kind of freak out. And so I think that's a big piece of, of what's happening right now on the collective level. And, and we're looking for somebody to blame, you know, and instead of just being like, okay, this happened, it is, it is what it is. You know, what, what do we do now? How do we move forward? A lot of people are being hijacked by their limbic system. And what happens is you'll get the hijacking and the shutdown of the frontal lobe, which you see is happening here. And now all of a sudden you can't cope well anymore. Uh, the problem with that is if that response gets stuck on, your immune system actually goes out of balance as well, which we don't want to happen when there's a viral pathogen floating around. Um, and we don't really want it to happen anyway regardless of if there is a, a virus like the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, I think that's kind of our, the, on the, the social level, our reaction 
uh, the sociocultural level. That's, that's kind of what our reactions are. Um, in terms of why it's happening, I don't have a good answer for that, but you know, I think it, it really shows us how, how truly unhealthy we are as a population. And I think it's a reflection of uh, something called mitochondrial heteroplasmy and, and how bad most of the world's mitochondria are functioning. If you don't know what mitochondria are, mitochondria were really, really, really old bacteria that invaded our, an animal cell. And now they're produced in the hundreds to the thousands in every single one of our cells. It's the only reason we can even build such a complex multicellular human body is because of these little mitochondria. And when you have, when you, when you don't live in congruency with nature, your, your mitochondrial heteroplasmy level is higher. Really interesting research. Um, if, if you want to check, I can send some off too. There's a, a researcher named Dr. Doug Wallace, who I honestly think is at the verge of a Nobel Prize. Um, he has proved that cancer is not genetic. It is mitochondrial. It is a mitochondrial disease. Um, he's proved that a lot of neurological diseases are not genetic. They are a mitochondrial disorder. Um, and chronic immune suppression, chronic immune problems, almost everything can be tied back to these little tiny mitochondrial organelles. And they're, they're sensitive to light and they're sensitive to magnetism. So I, I think if anything, it, it really just reflects how how poor our mitochondria and our and our world are functioning um there's there's a great book by a neurosurgeon named dr jack cruz called epipaleo rx uh illustrates and lays all this out but you know essentially and and like even where i am right now you'll see i have these uh, really weird glasses on um you know being inside and, and and with windows even that will skew the light feedback that's coming through your eyeball and that's triggering melanopsin receptors on your skin. Um, so we, we have a lot of dysregulation there. Um, you know, I, there's a method called the Wim Hof method that, that helps address a little bit of this. And, he, and he, uh, uh, you, might, you must know the Wim Hof method back there. You've been practicing it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Love it. That's great. Yeah, so, you know, one, one practice for me, especially in winter, is I go outside on exposed runs. I wear sh little short shorts, and that's it. And I go and I go when I run. I don't care if it's minus fifteen or minus twenty. I'm out and I'm running. I'm getting sunlight. I'm getting cold exposure. Um, it, it's what rebalances leptin, uh, a hormone that comes from the brain that will then balance out your mitochondria. We don't do that up here for the most part. People look at me like I'm insane, right? I'm like I'm doing cold baths in the morning, and it's like, man, what's wrong with you? But I know that my mitochondria aren't going to function well if I get stuck inside, right? So we're stuck inside. We're in front of screens. Um, with this quarantine, now people are, getting, are actually scared to kind of go outside. They're, they're un unfamiliar with whether they should or shouldn't. And so they're not getting sunlight. They're not getting proper light because they have windows kicking out the purple and the red wavelength of light. They aren't getting cold. They're not doing things. And so their mitochondria just start functioning worse and worse. And if you look up mitochondrial heteroplasmy, and I can, I can send this out in a follow-up email, you, you'll find a ton of research on this and, and how light and the circadian rhythm getting shifted off will screw that right up. And your immune system then becomes completely screwed. So yes. you look at melatonin connections to the immune system, um, leptin connections to the immune system and you, you can mess things up in a hurry. So, you know, I think it's, you know, it's been a hundred years since the last pandemic and it just goes to show us that we're missing something big when it comes to our health. Um, you know, one thing you see in Calgary, I mean, uh, you know, surrounded by cement. Thank, thankfully I don't live too far from the mountains so I can deke out of here quick. Um, but you know, I'm in a high rise. So yeah, there, there's even, things I need to do to ground properly. Uh, you know, a magnetic mattress pad I have to have. There's these things I have to do. And I know if I don't do them, I'm going to get into trouble. And so I kind of have to go the extra mile. You guys out, you know, basically living on the beach, shit, you, you know, walk outside, start walking down the street, shirt off, you know, go hit the sand. You're grounded. You're getting sunrise, sunset. It's, it's that, that's how we need to be living, but we aren't doing that in the majority of places. The majority of the population isn't doing it. 
and we're definitely not doing it in the cities. Yeah, and well, then, yeah. Yeah, so. We have a few questions, I think. Yeah, to follow up from some of that, I mean, before the call, you were quickly asking, like, if it's possible for us to even leave. We're in community and quarantine right here. Um, the last flights out of, uh, to get back to Canada aren't really happening. A lot of our different countries that we're involved with here. Um, but you're like, great, stay where you are. Like, uh, <laughs> enjoy the fun. like you said, enjoy being barefoot, being grounded. And so those are things that help build the mitochondria back up being like That's right, right. Really attuned with uh, mm -hmm. natural circadian rhythm and, and sunlight and feet firmly on, on earth. Like that, those are things that build that. That's right. Because we're, we're actually a semiconductor between the electrons coming from the sun and the magnetic field of earth. And so if we, if you get like, you start wearing rubber shoes, driving in a car with rubber tires, um, living in a high rise building, right? You're, you're not getting the same magnetic flux. Now you couple that with electromagnetic frequencies in the radio frequency and wireless tech range that that also skews with our ability to kind of tap into our our magnetic clock so to try to to try to simplify what um what what we what how our circadian rhythm essentially regulates is we have three circadian clocks uh one clock is, runs off the magnetic fields that it picks up in the environment okay um, what we're supposed to pick up is a DC magnetic current, which is essentially the magnetic field of Earth. And then we have another clock that detects light. And this is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, in, um, uh, the back, the kind of the, the brain. And that calibrates the magnetic clock. The clock isn't perfect. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't run things on, a, on exactly it's kind of a 24-hour basis. Um, so it needs to be calibrated by light. So when we when we wake up in the morning and we get sunrise exposure, we'll we'll get recalibration of our clock. And when those clocks line up with each other and calibrate each other, we're in good shape. We're going to get good production of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine to get us through the day. We're going to get good production of GABA and melatonin at night so we can sleep and repair. Um, you, you can't bypass this by supplementing melatonin, unfortunately. It doesn't work the same. Um, there's a third by, uh, clock as well that is the, basically the enteric, part of the enteric nervous system. Um, we actually have melanopsin receptors in the gut to detect light. And this is where the microbiome comes in and um, timing our meals appropriately for one. Um, but the, these all kind of line up to run our circadian rhythm. And if, if you get something called a circadian mismatch, and so a circadian mismatch is basically um, the brain has the ability to predict what, what's going to happen. So if you're getting light exposure all day, the sun goes down, the predicting, okay, this is where we should be based on the magnetic clock. Um, and then all of a sudden we flip a screen on, and we get hammered with a big blue, a big wavelength of blue light. Okay, this is what what creates uh, what's called a circadian mismatch. So now the eye is picking up something that's mismatching what time of day it actually is. So we, when we get a circadian mismatch, your clock genes, which is just a, a big set of genes that are that are in our cell, get get completely screwed up, and we don't repair and we don't regenerate properly. If this goes on too long, our immune system goes out of balance, we inflame, and now you start creating disease. And you can't mediate and regulate your immune system as well, which is, which is the big problem with this virus and almost every other virus that, is, that causes disease in humans, is you're not able to regulate the innate inflammatory or what's called cytokine storm that your body is spinning out to try to deal with the virus. This is what creates fever, um, it's what creates fatigue. It's what creates uh, most of the symptoms we get when we get sick. And so if, if the circadian rhythm is not regulated properly, our immune system doesn't get regulated properly and you, you start getting in trouble. So that's, that, that's to me, this, this is a big reflection and a big sign that we need to change what we're doing for our health because it, you know, our immune systems obviously aren't working very good. Um, this, of course, is a, a 
dangerous virus. It, it mutated in, a, in an interesting way. Um, it, it's highly contagious. But like any other new virus that we're ever exposed to, we have to be able to manage it long enough to build antibodies and fight it off. It's no different than any other new virus. It's just that it's hitting so many of us all at once. So that, you know, that to me is, is what it's really reflecting and saying to me is like, hey, man, we, we really got to do something about um, how our immune systems are regulating. So, right. And so you're saying that even though we're inside, like finding ways to ground, finding ways to get some sunlight through um, stepping onto your balcony or anything like that, go really far. Meditation, these things are good to help boost the immune system. How, how in your opinion, does meditation and yoga um, boost some of these, whether it's the mitochondria or the, the frequency in our, in our brain? Uh, simply stress reduction. It, it drops the, the spike of adrenaline, noradrenaline, and subsequently cortisol. Uh, so when you do that, you're, you're able to mount a stronger natural killer cell response, um, a stronger macrophage response. You're, you basically have a stronger immune response when you're not stressed. So you know, a lot of people are going to get sick when they get stressed. And, and so yoga and meditation is a really good way to just get control of that limbic system that might be running, 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 running all the time um, and creating threat responses in, in the body. Now, if you can do yoga on the grass, in the sand, in the sun, triple bonus, right? Because now, now you're getting the foundational physics of health. That's the physics of health the physics of medicine, the physics of biology. Um, a lot of really good material on that that I can forward your way as well. So you, you just, you, ha you have to look at going the extra mile. You don't need to spend four hours a day doing it. You know, on a busy day for me, I wake up, I get out, I'm on the eighth floor of a, of a condo building, not ideal. And it's, you know, I'm not gonna be here forever, that's for sure. But uh, I get out on the balcony, in my underwear, I brush my teeth, I chill out there as long as I can before I get too cold. And then I come back inside, I, I do a little workout, I might do a two or three minute cold bath. Benefits to doing that is you if you do a bath, you don't have to be in the cold as long. Um, you get more energy transfer with water than you do air. So, uh, you know, I do that. And you know, it's about a 45 minute routine. And, that, and that's about it in, in the morning. And then I kind of go off on my day. If I can squeeze some time to get out around noon or solar noon, uh, especially right now, you, you are getting UVB index. Uh, you guys would have crazy UVB index where you are. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be red as a tomato. But um, up here, it's, it's important because that, that, of course, is going to allow you to produce vitamin D and another hormone called MSH. Uh, and MSH is an incredibly important important at regulating the immune system, uh, arguably one of the most important uh, peptide hormones at regulating the immune system. So you know, that, that's what I do. I make sure I'm getting out at least once or twice a day with my feet on the grass. Um, we, I do have a, 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 about a $1,500 magnetic mattress pad uh, that, I, that we use that mimics the magnetic field of earth because we're eight stories high. Um, that, you know, that's really important as well, uh, cause we're not sleeping close enough to the ground, but, uh, you know, that, that's kind of this, that the extra mile stuff that I need to do. Um, there's also other things you can do like, uh, juve lights. You've probably heard of juve before J O O V. Uh, so they're red, they're red infrared lights. Um, they, they help replace the red spectrum of light that is lost from windows um, as well as, as have a red light instead of a LED or a fluorescent that's a, that's a blue or green dominant light. Um, they're kind of a, of course, warm, uh, warm type color of light. They, uh, yeah, really, some really good things you can do with those as well. But if you're somewhere where you can, you can get out with the sun, get up with the sunrise, get outside, get some sun during the day, ground, and if you can sleep close to the ground at night, uh, you don't have a bunch of Wi-Fi and cell phone towers and stuff like that nearby. You're pretty much, you're good. I mean, you're good to go. And a lot of guys that are in the biophysics research, they, they like to live between 30th North and 30th South as close to the equator as possible because they, they know that's where the lowest rates of disease are typically, uh, chronic disease anyway. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, 
and, and especially where you guys are, Madaris, right? The, the, the smaller villages, um, you're not you're not having all the EMF pollution and you're not having all the, you know, the cement everywhere. It's, it's, it's pretty much as close to nature as you can get. So there's, yeah, there's, there's a method to, uh, to my madness anyway. And it, you know, it's, since I've been integrating this, I've always struggled with seasonal affective problems, fatigue and low mood every winter, get sick every winter. Last few years, I haven't gotten sick. I haven't gotten fatigued. I actually like the winter up here now. It's crazy because I I just like so full of energy because I get to be cold all the time. Uh, but yeah, you know it's it's an, an interesting. So I, I think it's just if anything, again, circling back, repeating myself over and over again, it just shows how disconnected from nature we really are. Yeah, that's is really what's happening. Going going back to your talking about cortisol being the main stress hormone, right? Cortisol killer, I guess. And how chronic stress hormone, yeah, right, yeah. Is that something that is a frequency that we can feel? Like I feel like the whole world has undergone an additional cortisol, or you know, like the stress, the fear. Is that something we can tangibly feel and be in like that frequency that we're? You can, you can, you can definitely feel the effects of cortisol. Um, it's different for everybody. There's eight. There's eight stages of cortisol dysregulation. Um, and cortisol is actually uniquely coupled with another hormone called DHEA. Um, and it, it kind of has to do with the ratio that they're in. And it, and it moves from the acute stress response, which is a noradrenaline, adrenaline, or an epinephrine response. So the best example is like, say, for instance, you get into a car accident or almost get into a car accident or you have a near miss of some sort, right? Your, your heart rate goes up your heart's pounding in your chest, right? You might freeze a little bit and then you're kind of like, oh, oh my God. And then when you can kind of come back to being rational again, that feeling of like your heart kind of pumping, pounding in your chest and you feel kind of almost nauseous, like an anxious stomach, that's typically, that's typically a cortisol response. You'll also kind of feel a little bit like your body will almost feel kind of tired, but your mind will be going a, a million miles a minute that that can that's kind of the like the initial spike of cortisol and then if that stays going on and on and on for a really long time you you generally you'll move into something called the dorsal vagal state which is just you'll feel overwhelmed all the time everything will be overwhelming um, sensory information is overwhelming you might feel hopeless helpless um, you might get almost like ADD or focus problems you won't be able to pay attention to one thing at a time um, some people even get into the state where there's, there's such low mood that they're, they're depressed or they might even feel suicidal. Um, that, that is the freeze or play dead response. And that's actually a cortisol drop. So we, we, our cortisol can dip and then we feel terribly in a different way. So there, there's different ways it manifests. So, you know, some people right now is their kind of initial cortisol hit, whereas other people have had cortisol hits for 20 years. And, and they're in different states of this cortisol rhythm. So it's, it's complicated. It's not as simple as, you know, cortisol is higher, it's low. There, it's a very complicated relationship with, uh, with several hormones. But right. um, the point being is, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to feel the effects of it if you're tuned in enough to what's going on in your body and your brain. And from, uh, you'll your, definitely, you'll definitely from your experience it. working with frequency of the brain and uh, light waves and different things, do you, do you feel that's a frequency that can then be emitted to other people like if you're in a city full of fearful cortisol spiked people is that not going to have an effect on your own body for, for sure yeah for sure because you're you're picking up stimulus from around you so your your brain your brain picks up panic in the sounds of people's voices panic in the words that they're using um you know panic in the media all of that type of stuff and you know language is is heavily rooted in our limbic system so yeah that i mean we we get exposed to that stuff and it can absolutely heighten our cortisol right that that's why although you really want to pay attention and watch the news it's not always the best option mm -hmm. because you you just can get i mean it's all any news stations talking about right yeah. we got we have cbc radio up here you turn on cbc radio and it's pretty much just always somebody else talking about it, right? And, and sometimes it's good because it kind of puts you at ease. But you have to be really careful where you pick your material because there, there's something called cognitive dissonance, 
um, and cognitive resonance where you will you'll actually find and agree with and, and Facebook's the worst because they actually bring you more of what you are clicking on. <laughs> so they, they satisfy your bias of, oh, sh you know, things are really bad. Shit, things are really bad. And you keep clicking on these articles that, that are bad and negative and you keep getting more of it. That's how Facebook's designed. It, it works good aside from that because if I'm looking, you know, shopping for something, then it, it brings up trying to look for easier. The problem is, is if I get into a negative, Oh, I think we just lost you there for a second. Oh, 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 good. Where'd you lose me? Uh, just in that last little bit, talking about the, yeah, the way social media works and and mm -hmm. internet and all of that. Isn't um, that how confirmation bias works, like in general with our brain? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Our, our limbic system, its whole job is to keep us safe. So it looks for things that aren't safe in our environment and then make sure that we pay attention to them so that we can either avoid them or fight them. And, and you can actually see this. You can, do, you can do something called alpha and gamma asymmetry studies. You can do this on the brain um, where you actually flash images and words or phrases at somebody's brain and you can tell right away whether their brain wants to agree with it whether it wants to disagree with it and then what its reaction is whether it wants to fight it or avoid it really cool um so you, you can actually like you could run an assessment on someone and know them better than they'll know themselves a lot of the time because they a lot of people again aren't really in tune to that and so confirmation bias comes from that where you go oh see look See, I, I, knew, I knew that this was a bad virus and you pay attention to say, for instance, one, one case and then your brain can really just get momentum and blow it up and blow it up and blow it up and blow it up um, unless you realize that, okay, there might be another side to this, right? And we have the ability to redirect what we pay attention to if we can regulate that limbic system. Yeah. So it's just that limbic system wires itself in when we're in a, the third trimester in our mom's womb and it, it fully wires in by about age two or three before the frontal lobe starts coming online. So it, it's kind of, a, we, we can't really shut it down completely. We can just learn to regulate our reactions and learn. And that, and you know, as a, as a researcher, you have to be careful that way. Uh, you have to learn where your biases are um, so that you're not just, you know, grabbing research that confirms them. You also want to look at, at things on the other side to see, okay, where's the balance point. So that, you know, that's something that researchers constantly are are dealing with as well uh, to make sure that we're we're keeping away from that uh, confirmatory bias but yeah that's I mean that's a big thing and and like I say we've never had a pandemic pandemic and been this connected um, you know in a way it's it's good because governments can prep quicker um, in a way it's bad because now on the individual level I mean, we're just all feeding off each other and whether it's true information or not. Right. So um, it's, it's sure been interesting to, to sit back and watch it all unfold. Speaking of being connected, uh, Corey, um, I'd like to hear your, your opinion on 5G. That seems to be a big topic these days, whether it's pointing at either the, the glory of being connected and then how much is being connected is too bad and the frequencies that, the difference between 4G and 5G, if you've got some information. Yeah, infinity. yeah, oh yeah, I, I, I definitely have a bit, um, and, I, and I can send you a great resource. Um, his name is Mitch Marchand from EMF Aware. Uh, he's an electrical engineer actually in Calgary. Has, has a lot of great info on this. The difference between, so when we went from the first generation to the second generation was basically us allowing, uh, having the ability to send pictures and videos, right? Um, so we went from talk and text to pictures, videos. Then we went to 3G, which allowed us to access the internet. Okay. 4G LTE was a way for us to do the exact same thing, except stream way quicker, right? So every time you do that, you increase the power density that needs to come off of a tower, 
Okay, you just be, you're basically amping up the the power that's coming out of it. Now, up until 5G, it was it was always a waveform, and so we have the, something called waveforms. It's basically the shape. Um, you can have box style waveforms. Um, you can have triangle style waveforms. You could have just rounded oval shaped waveforms. Um, we, they were all natural waveforms to Earth. We we just basically increased the power of them and then distributed them in a certain way. With 5G, we have completely changed and created an artificial wavelength, an artificial waveform. Oh, wow. So it's, it's not a waveform that is that any organism on Earth is familiar with. Um, so that, that is the one big hesitation for a lot of scientists um, who have signed petitions in various countries to uh, demand that more research be done before it be launched is we don't know what this waveform's effects on bio biological systems is. Uh, we know that there is a lot of problems with EMF, even in the natural waveform, when it's amped up in the way it is. I mean, there's been tons of research studied. The National Institute of Health, which is the most funded institute on human health in the entire world, reported in 2016 on the effects of Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 3G and 4G LTE networks, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, and you know, when the National Institute of Health says something isn't good, you pay attention, right? So there, there's a big hesitation by a lot of people to like, you know, let's, and, and you know, thankfully in Canada, the only thing we've had are the odd trial run of it turning on and off. Um, there's, I think there's only, 10 countries now that have had it turned on. Uh, but we, the, the thing is, is we, we just don't know that, that I think that is the biggest, the biggest hesitation, even on my part is we, we don't know what, what it's going to do. Uh, we know that the initial, it's going to come out into, in two waves. Um, the first wave is going to be a low frequency, um, low bandwidth style. That's going to run off of the current towers. And then the goal is eventually to have a high frequency bandwidth where when you have the higher frequency uh, waveforms don't go as far. So you need antennas everywhere. So you, that's, this is where you'll see the articles on like having them in every street light because that's what they're going to have to do if they're going to, if they're going to roll it out that way uh, because the high frequency stuff doesn't go far enough. So it's kind of like uh, the difference between AM and FM radio, right? AM radio, like you can sometimes in Calgary get a get an AM radio from um, Minnesota, you know, which is which is crazy. FM, you can't get it much further than Edmonton, you know, not even not even Red Deer if you're lucky, right? And that's because FM runs on a much higher bandwidth, and the higher bandwidth uh, essentially fizzles out quicker. It can't travel quite as far. So it's kind of the benefit of 5G is, is if you have some trees around your property, it's going to be really difficult for 5G to get through them. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversy around 5G being connected to the virus. Um, you know, I, I don't think so because it's literally been recorded in every country now. Um, and a lot of it being community cases now. I know that's the case in Canada. Um, and a lot of countries, the majority of countries in the world haven't even turned on a 5G tower. So I, I don't think it's, it's connected to the virus. However, on its own separate topic, I think it's something we should be paying attention to. Uh, and we should be demanding some, some good quality third party research being done um, before it's being approved by government, which, which is always, always should be the case. But, you know, the companies, these big corporations have a way of, of pushing things through and and getting through the red tape very easily and very quickly and you know you and i couldn't ever get through like that they do uh, because they they have a lot of money so uh you know i think it's something that, that we definitely need to pay attention to because again it's going to come back to create it's going to create mitochondrial dysfunction it's going to create mitochondrial heteroplasmy almost guaranteed because it, it's still the same thing as a, as a 3g 4g it's just a different waveform it's a different shape so uh, that you know that's my kind of two cents on that again not a lot of published research here so we still we still are speculating a lot yeah thank you for your insight on that i think gav had a few other questions i have a few questions mm -hmm. um so just taking on on uh, something you said earlier how do you regulate your reactions mm. so 
in terms of the limbic system? Yeah. Well, some of the best work is actually doing research on your family history. Um, I really love techniques like biofeedback, neurofeedback, EMDR, brain spotting, um, Jungian psychology with dream analysis, surprisingly insightful. Um, yeah, there, there's some really good books on that topic. But I, yeah, I, I find you, you have to find a way to tap into the limbic system and tap into the memories of, okay, you know, why, why would it be that I react this way in this situation, right? And I, I think it's mainly about going and introspecting right? Instead of going, oh man, that, that guy pissed me off, or I don't agree with that. And, and he shouldn't be saying that. What, what is it reminding you of? You know, is it reminding you of a loss of control? And for a lot of people with the, the COVID going on, it is a, there's a loss of, of control factor going on. You know, okay, well, when, when's the earliest time you can remember losing control, right? Or when is the earliest time you can remember not, you know, not being able to predict what's going on, not having any control, right? And I know some people that dad was a drinker, and would fly off the handle at any given moment, right? Is it, you can go and kind of work through that stuff because that's really what it is. The limbic system has no way to project into the future. So all it is is it's tapping into old painful memories and it's going, okay, this is, this is happening just like this old memory. Unfortunately, sometimes we, we've really buried this stuff in our subconscious. So it, we, we, when we do brain mapping, we look at a particular frequency called theta um, theta, theta is the, the frequency in the brain that is that the limbic system uses to communicate. And so in people that have high theta, where they're being, they're being more hijacked on a daily basis, neurofeedback is incredible. Um, brain spotting is really good for that. We have the ability now to do neurofeedback remotely as well. It used to be a process that had to be done in the clinic. Um, but our brain mapping, which is uh, an example I was showing you there on the screen, um, that can actually be done at the house now. So we can, we can ship out units. People can do that at the house and they can do neurofeedback as well. We just set up a protocol for them. If people are in really low theta state, the, they do really well with EMDR techniques, bilateral stimulation tapping techniques, um, craniosacral therapy, and psychedelics. Um, people with high theta don't do as well with psychedelics. This, this is a biomarker that we can actually use for people that are looking to utilize psychedelics in, in a high theta state, they don't do well. They get hijacked. They tend to be the ones that have a bad time and, and can't kind of, you know, lean into it as well. Um, whereas the people with the low theta, it helps them bring up everything that's being kind of shut down so there, there's a lot of different approaches um that can be kind of tailored to, do, to be able to do that do meditate deep 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 state meditation theta type meditations as well we'll do it yeah how, how can you gauge the amount of theta it's tough it, it takes a lot of practice a lot of practice um we've we've we have some published research and call and colleagues of mine have published research on and compare, comparing monks who are expert meditators with people who are, you know, they call they are self-proclaimed meditators. And there's a big difference between what they can do with their brain. And so a lot of people that we've looked at with meditation practice, it takes years and years and years and years to be able to get yourself into that induced state of state. Um, but it, it's kind of that state where you're not quite asleep, but you're not fully awake either. Every, everybody's felt it, you know, it's, it, you get into that. I, I, I typically can't get into that state unless I have something, a uh, type of a guided meditation. Uh, if I'm just laying there doing my breath work, I'm typically just getting into an alpha state. Um, but if I, if you can tap into a good guided meditation, that seems to be the best way. Um, hypnosis is good at getting into the theta state as well. What's um, that typically is, is the REM, the dream state. Yeah. REM, yeah. REM, REM's dream. Yeah, but it REM is different because REM is a REM is a beta beta spindle um, that spindles around thirteen to fifteen hertz, uh, whereas theta is like a four to seven hertz frequency. So REM and theta are different, um, but you'll have when you're in that REM state, you'll get a little bit of theta projecting. So this is where like Jungian psychologists have been doing this for a really long time. They do dream analysis, uh, get you to write down your dreams, and then they help you 
essentially decode your dream because dreams are, are highly metaphorical. The limbic system is very metaphorical because it's stimulus based. It's not logical or rational based. So um, yeah, all, all of those show really good promise with working with theta. Um, some people don't dream easily. Um, which are usually people you'll see when you look at their brain waves, they'll have really low theta and sometimes really low delta. Um, and then there's people that dream all the time, nonstop. And it's like exhausting for them because they feel like they don't even get any sleep. That's usually a high theta subtype. Um, so different approaches for different types of people. We, we've kind of been able to tailor that on, you know, what, what they're going to do better with. But surely so. the more you meditate, the more you can access these, um, these frequencies or these states, right? Or is there yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And you can you can learn to you can learn to access a theta state. You, basically, you learn what what you can do in the environment around you that will allow you to be able to get into that theta state. Because if your if your limbic system is is triggered too much, you won't be able to access it as well. Um, so it's yeah, it's it's a really kind of really interesting. Uh, prefrontal, precuneus, um, cingulate limbic system reaction. So there's an area on the crown of our head called the precuneus. Its whole job is an introspection. Wow. Um, it's uh, there's a network called the default mode network. Um, and if you can if you can turn that on, you can you can introspect and and if you can quiet your your frontal lobe enough, you can you can definitely learn to access those areas. It does take a lot of practice though like i think a lot of people underestimate how much practice it does require so uh, i usually recommend like i say something guided um you definitely need to know how to how to breathe properly because if you're not getting into a good rhythm of of diaphragmatic breath work you're going to activate your sympathetic nervous system and you're not going to be able to access it so that that's where i always work with people on is like everybody that comes into our clinic for the most part, the very first thing they learn how to do is regulate their heart rate with diaphragmatic breathing. That's And so there's really good devices called uh, biofeedback devices that do heart rate variability training. Um, the, the company, my favorite company is HeartMath. Mm -hmm. For that, they have something called an EM wave. The, they're incredible because what they'll do is not only are they going to give you feedback, letting you know when you're in a good heart rate variability, and when you're regulating your nervous systems well, or regulating your heart rate well, um, but they're also going to give light uh, visual and auditory feedback, which actually gives feedback to your limbic system and the reward centers of the colliculus and the um, nucleus accumbens. And so you'll actually, your brain will start integrating that state. And you'll actually find when people, what people find when they start using it is they'll find lots of different times through the day, they'll just start breathing. And they'll go, oh, I don't think I was deep breathing. And their, their body just starts getting into this automatic response to deep breathe. It's really, it's really interesting. And so those, those devices are uh, unbelievable because they, they allow you to, they allow the practice that you're doing to trickle down into the unconscious way quicker. Wow. So do we get people to do at least two to three months of daily practice with that um, while we do neurofeedback, other alternative medicine techniques, but I mean, ultimately what I find true healing is, is learning what you need to do in the environment around you, how to control your environment around you and how to control and regulate your nervous system. If you can do that, you can get, once you use other techniques to get yourself better, you can keep yourself better and you can keep yourself regulating. So that, that is the most important healing response I think there is. Yeah. Um, we just, I had another question. Um, yeah. Just many questions, but two two more for me. What what is your take on plant medicine as a neuroscientist? Mm. Plant medicine in terms of say ayahuasca. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, psychotropic or, or psychedelic medicines. Yeah. So I mean, amazing. They the, the, a lot of the research. I mean, even things like ketamine now being used, which isn't really technically plant medicine, but um, is psychedelic IV ket ketamine for uh, medication resistant depression. I think it, 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 it allows us to open up states uh, and access sometimes memories that are, that are really holding us back. I think it needs to be done carefully. Um, you, you know, you're, met, you're, you're playing with neurochemistry, um, but 
you know, there's a lot of substances that we use daily that play with neurochemistry as well. You know, caffeine, alcohol, uh, you know, these are messing with our neurochemistry just as much. We just are, are more conditioned to them. So we, you know, I think, I think there's a, a very good place for them. Uh, we've, we've done a little bit of, um, not, not, we haven't done direct research, but I've dug a, a lot into some research on this. It's really, really cool. The kind of long-term effects of it and how it, how it changes brain networks. For the most part, any psychedelic is not, is, is not going to give you good effects if you're doing it all the time. Chronic use is not ideal. Okay, that's one thing that we've definitely learned. Um, the other thing is we have a, uh, a frequency in our brain called gamma. Gamma frequency, it's the highest frequency in the brain. Um, we've actually, it's only been the last uh, five to 10 years that we've even had technology sensitive enough to, to isolate it from muscle activity. Um, but it's, it's the binding rhythm or the integrating rhythm. Um, so we'll find that people with high gamma do really well with psychedelics. People with low gamma, they not that they're going to have like a bad time or a bad trip. They just have a really hard time integrating or accessing anything helpful with them. So, uh, yeah, again, you know, this, this isn't a big population. It's only about population of about 20 people that we've had, but people that have gone and done ayahuasca ceremonies and that sort of thing. But again, they, they can be extremely beneficial for people. So this, just like a lot of other alternative medical techniques. Uh, I think if you know that there are traumas that are holding you back and, and you have these limbic responses and the easiest thing is to, if you get a QEEG, you'll know immediately um, what, if you're having a limbic response or not, but, uh, and this is the difficulty because sometimes you'll get really stressed, anxious, and overwhelmed, but it's an immune inflammatory or metabolic or an endocrine response. It's not a limbic response. So it's sometimes difficult to tap out. But if you know you have a history of trauma, emotional trauma, developmental trauma, anything like that, um, codependent relationships, anything, they, they can be really helpful to help just like kind of open up insights. Because if you can get the conscious insight, of what's going on for you, you can connect back to that. And, and all of a sudden your, your limbic system and your cortex kind of, they become coherent. There's a, there's a measurement in EEG called coherence. Um, there's a coherence that happens. Um, now, interestingly, some of the brain maps we've looked at on psychedelics actually match up a lot for coherence patterns anyway, with drumming circles. We've, uh, we've done some, some uh, research with people in drumming circles. It's really cool what their brain does when, when they're kind of tuned into the, to the auditory, uh, just, just the whole experience of the drumming circle. It's the first time I ever, ever was part of a drumming circle. And I, I, just, I, I started recording the guy I was brain mapping and I started drumming too. And it, it was surreal. It was, it was a really cool experience. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's what you're really doing is you're creating these coherence patterns in the brain and allowing it to all of a sudden it's like everything starts hyper communicating and you have a different level of access and it, you know, similar to hypnosis. So um, I think it's, it's important to, uh, you know, make sure that wherever you're doing it, whoever you're doing it with uh, that it's a trusted environment um, where you can kind of express freely. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, sometimes you can, uh, you can, of course there, there's, there's, there's the negative side effects that can happen as well, just like anything. But, uh, you know, typically very well safe, very well tolerated, very safe. Uh, and it will shift brain networks and, and a lot of times for the better for people. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess in a way, um, when you, I guess the only thing that would be holding people back from experiencing different plant medicines or psychedelics would be fear or intuition. Yeah. And it makes me wonder um, what your take is on intuition in general. Like, what is intuition and how do we tap into that? Intuition is very hard to measure. Yeah. In, in, into, intuition, true intuition hits a, it's quant, it hits a quantum mechanics. It hits quantum mechanics principles. So it, it's, it's really hard to measure. I mean, in, in the brain, it's like impossible to measure. Because 
you, but by the time you get the moment, it already happened. Right. So it, it's really hard to catch, but you look at how electrons can be entangled when you look at quantum mechanics and there's, there's something to do with that. We just haven't untangled it yet. <laughs> uh, but there, yeah, I mean, electrons can become entangled with each other. Um, quant, you know, thought, as soon as you have a thought that, that is entanglement happening in the brain. Um, so it's, it's just, it's really hard to measure, but you know, I, I, of course I feel, I feel that it's a real thing. Um, the, the difficulty is designing a, you know, you almost have to have like a, uh, electron tube like they do in Switzerland with like brains. I, you know, I don't even know how you would do it, but, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really hard to pick up on, but, uh, we, you know, we find that there's a lot of, a lot of connect in anybody that has picked it up to lower, lower regions of the brainstem. But the problem is it, it recruits all these different areas all at once. So you can't really tell where it's coming from. Right. All you can see is just how the brain is actually manifesting it. So, you know, there's a lot of theories that it's, it's something that's created outside of the brain and then manifests in. Um, we, yeah, we just, we have no way to figure it out yet. So, so when we make decisions though, that are, you know, a little bit fearful, would you recommend taking action or taking decisions based on intuition or more logic or like, how would you kind of gear yourself into making a decision like that? I, I, yeah, so I, uh, I, I kind of gear when, if I'm, if I'm afraid of something, I gear, it, I, I want to do it because I, I, a lot of times fear isn't, it's not a, it's not real. It's not rational. And it's usually from an old traumatic experience that you can actually desensitize your limbic system to with exposure. It's almost an exposure type therapy, right? So for me, if there's something that, that scares me, I usually want to do it. I just kind of weigh out the effects. Okay. You know, what does this do for, for my, for my life? Right. You know, um, obviously I'm not going to go like start doing street drugs because that's going to be problematic. So <laughs> uh, to me, you know, I want to stay away from that, but there's something like uh, doing a psychedelic, you know, I, I, if I, I feel a little bit of fear about it, it's not always real. It might, it might not necessarily be intuition. I I'm definitely more logical. My wife is more intuitive. So, you know, for her, her decisions sometimes come quicker. And when they don't come quick, she usually just kind of doesn't make the decision. Uh, for me, I'm like, I got to make a decision, right? So, I, yeah, I mean, I weigh it out rationally, but just because I feel afraid, I, I definitely don't hold back because um, that, that fear is irrational and it's from an old past memory. It's not necessarily real, right? But a lot of people run really well off their intuition and if, if you know the difference between fear and intuition they definitely act on your intuition that's that like enteric we talk about the enteric nervous system the you know the, the gut um the gut feeling right um that we we think the gut feeling comes from the brain stem and the vagal nerve and it has a really fast trigger to the to the gut before it can be processed by our rational mind so it, it's, yeah, I mean, if you can, if you can differentiate the two for sure. So. Awesome. Corey, thank you so much for uh, jumping on a call with us today. We always appreciate your insight and uh, yeah, happy, happy to, where can, where can people find some more information of some of the, the projects and clinics you've got running? Yeah. So uh, we have uh, well, YouTube channel. Uh, we post frequently on, on social media. If you just search us at Nirvana health. Um, you can find that. I'll just uh, post our website in the chat here. Great. Yeah, we'll, we'll put some things up. We'll, we'll be putting the video up again uh, online after. So, perfect. And then we are do we do um, we do complimentary phone consults with anybody e either either looking for help finding what what can what they can do to help themselves, um, whether they're looking to actually work with us. Uh, whether they're looking to partner or collaborate with us. Uh, we, we have partnerships in place with lots of different practitioners. Um, you know, we help show them what our, our database is, how it works, how they can help other people. Um, you, can, you can reach out uh, www.nirvana.ca forward slash go. Um, and it'll just allow you to book a scheduled call with a healthcare advisor, completely complimentary. 
and we can help, you know, guide you in the direction that, that you're looking for, or, you know, uh, maybe at least give you some extra info that you might be looking for. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you again. And uh, we're, we hope you're staying healthy and grounded and uh, full of those UV vitamin D light as well. Yeah. Love it. Love it. All right, Thanks bro. a lot, John. Thanks guys. Take care. Sorry.